All right, I have a question for you today. How many of you would love to not be afraid of anything? We just sang the song, Fear, You've Lost Your Power. Fear's lost its power. How many of you would love to say anything you're afraid of? You're afraid of, um, you're afraid of your finances, what they're going to do. You're afraid of relationships. You're afraid of, uh, of, of, of the election. <laughs> you're, you're, fr- you're afraid, you're afraid of the, you're afraid of, of work. What, other, what else are you afraid of? What other fears are out there? What? Heights. <laughs> We're afraid of all kinds of things, and I'd love to not be afraid of anything. I'd love to be able to say I'm not afraid of anything, and God wants that for us. In fact, what God wants for us is for us to thrive. God wants for us to love our lives. God wants us to be fulfilled. Last week, Pastor Doug did a great job talking about the shepherd and talking about the gate. And and in that passage, John 10, Jesus says, I have come to give life to the fullest. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give full life. How many of you want full life? I want a full life. And there's a a full life without fear. That I don't fear lacking anything that I truly need. Jesus is my shepherd and I shall not want. That I don't have to be afraid of not knowing the voice of God or knowing where he's directing me. That I know that I can clearly hear his voice. Listen, God wants all of that for you. And I want that for you as your pastor. And I want that for myself too. And there's one way I know to get it. There's one way biblically I know to get it. Today I want to talk about that. And in fact, today it's not really a sermon, which is kind of weird for me. I don't normally do this. It's what I'm calling a pastoral exhortation. It was just something I felt so heavy on my heart over these last few weeks and few days. And I knew I wasn't, I put some notes together here, but this wasn't structured as a sermon. It's just something I'm supposed to share with you because I believe there's a lot of fear out there. And I believe there's a lot of people that don't feel like they're thriving out there. And there's something that's so important for us to understand about how to address that. But it's scary. Are you ready to hear something scary today? Okay, it's not actually scary, but it sounds scary when you talk about it. But I'm going to unpack it. I'm going to talk to us about why it's not scary and why it's one of the most important things you will ever, ever grasp You may know about this if you're an older believer, but if you're a newer believer, we have a lot of newer believers here, a lot of returning people to Jesus. Maybe you don't know about this, so we're going to explain it. Anybody ready to hear what it is? Yeah. Yeah. The key to not being afraid of anything is the fear of the Lord. The key to not being afraid of anything else is the fear of the Lord. And we're going to talk about that today. Now, you're going, wait a minute. Pastor Tim, that doesn't make sense. You're saying, don't be afraid of anything, but fear the Lord. How do we do that? In fact, how do you rectify this idea of the fear of the Lord, which is all over Scripture, with the fact that also all over Scripture, it says, fear not. How many of you have ever heard that in the Bible, there are 366 times when the Bible says, fear not, one for every day and one for leap year, just in case it's leap year. Okay, have you ever heard that? Well, it's not true. Uh, somebody made that up. There's like 150 times when it says fear not, but that's still a lot of times, right? It says fear not over and over and over again. One of the biggest commands in scripture is to not fear. But at the same time, it's that many times, almost that many times, it also tells us to fear the Lord. But we hear this phrase, fear the Lord, and then we read verses like, 1 John 4, 18, that says there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So if God is love and there is no fear in love and perfect love, who is God, drives out all fear, then how, why am I to fear the Lord? 2 Timothy 1, 7 says this, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That you're not having to be afraid of anything And yet the Bible says to fear God. It says, do not fear and fear God. These things, these these feel like they're, they're mutually exclusive, but they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, I want to tell you the fear of God is wildly misunderstood. So for the next few minutes this morning, we're simply going to correct that misunderstanding 
And then we're going to come to the cross and we're going to receive communion together. And if you're visiting us today, I'm really glad you're here. Please don't bolt for the door because I think you're going to find a really grace-filled message this morning because the fear of God is one of the greatest gifts that God can give us and one of the greatest things that we can lean into. The fear of God is wildly misunderstood. And, And by the way, the reason it's wildly misunderstood is because the enemy of our soul, Satan, does not want you to understand the fear of God. He does not want you to understand the fear of God because he knows as soon as you grasp this this idea of the fear of God, and as soon as you start living into the fear of God, everything changes. Everything in your life changes. What is the fear of God? It, It has nothing to do with being afraid of God. It has nothing to do with being scared of God. Even though the fear of God is the phrase, this this idea of the fear of God over the fear of everything else has nothing to do. Being afraid of God drives you away from God. When you're afraid of something, you stay as far away as you can. When I asked what fears were out there, some joker over here said fear of heights. But it's not a joke if you're afraid of heights. And if you're afraid of heights, guess what? If somebody takes you to the Grand Canyon, guess how far away from the edge you stay? Very, very, very far. So if you're afraid of God, you're going to stay far away from God. And that's not God's desire at all that you stay far away from him. His desire is that you would draw close to him. And the fear of God is what draws you close to him. It's not being afraid of God. The fear of God is, get it, this is the definition. We're going to camp on this for a little bit. The fear of God is hating sin. The fear of God is hating evil. In fact, Proverbs 8.13 defines the fear of God for us. And we're going to read through a few other scriptures, but we're going to leave this one on the screen because I want you to go away today remembering this verse. It's an easy verse to remember. It simply says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And we're going to get that up on the screen. We're going to look at that. We're going to get it in our eyes and then we're going to repeat it together. Proverbs 8.13 I'm saying it like if I say it enough, it's just going to show up on the screen. I'm not sure if that's the truth or not. But to fear, oh, there we go. It is the truth. Okay. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. Say that with me. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. Why? Because evil hurts us. When you think about the world and you think about the things that we're truly afraid of, If you dig down deep into it, it's really, there are evil things that we become afraid of. There are sinful things that we see happening and sin. The definition of sin is that it's brokenness. It's rebellion against God. God who is life and light and love. God is love. Not love is God, by the way. God is love. If you want to see the perfect definition of love, you look at God. God who is love and light and life and wholeness. We're going to talk about wholeness in a minute. Evil and sin separates us from wholeness. It brings brokenness. It hurts us. It hurts others. Sin and evil rejects God and it rejects his life. And so to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Now, this idea of fearing the Lord and hating evil and not fearing anything else, it shows up over and over and over and over again in the Bible. And while, can we leave that scripture up just over for the next few minutes as I'm reading through? I really want that, I want that to just get like lasered into our heart. So if you're not looking at me, if you're looking up there, I want it, I want it to be there. So let me read some other, other scriptures for you. In 1 Samuel 12, Samuel is appointing the first king Israel would have. And he says these words, they're, they're all together. But be sure to fear the Lord... He's telling the people of of God, I'm going to appoint a king, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. So fear the Lord and that's going to keep you away from doing evil and letting evil come in and bringing destruction to both you and your king. In Exodus 20, Moses is on the mountain. He's getting the Ten Commandments, a very important document, right? God's writing the Ten Commandments on the stone. And there's fire on the mountain and there's smoke on the mountain and the people are afraid to come near the mountain. 
while Moses is up there doing business with God. And it says he comes down the mountain and he delivers the Ten Commandments. And right after he delivers the Ten Commandments, he says these words in Exodus 20, 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Say that with me. Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. Do not be afraid. The fear of God is coming to you so that you will not sin. Do not be afraid, but embrace the fear of God. I love Psalm 34. It's like a a workbook on the fear of God. It starts this. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Uh, He says says this. "I, I sought the Lord and he heard me. He answered me. Uh, bad things were happening to me. And so I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Anybody in this room want to be delivered from all your fears? Every fear you ever had, every fear you have now and every fear you could ever have. God can deliver you from every one of your fears. But in a couple of verses, it goes on and it says this, this psalmist who says, the Lord delivered me from all my fears and I bless the Lord because of that. He goes on to say, Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Okay, so let me ask again. How many of you want to be delivered from all your fears? How many of you would like to lack nothing? Okay, both hands going up, right? The, 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 the fulcrum to be delivered from all your fears and to lack nothing that you need, that you truly need. We learn to fear the Lord. We learn to fear the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7.1, because it's not just Old Testament. The fear of the Lord is in the New Testament too. So Paul writes this, let us cleanse ourselves from every, every defilement of body and spirit. Every defilement. I'm not going to stand here this morning and unpack every defilement because we all deal with different defilements, right? Come on, be honest, Right? Every defilement of body and spirit. Why? Because God doesn't like it when you do bad things? No. That, sure. But there's a reason God doesn't like it when you do bad things. Not just because he's a moral cop looking for you to do the right things and not do, not do the wrong things. God doesn't like it when we do hurtful things to ourselves and to other people. He doesn't like it when we allow evil to work in through our lives and sin and brokenness and death to work in and through our lives because God is holy. He is whole. He is righteous. By the way, holy isn't just some religious word. Holy means whole. How many of you want to be whole? I want to be whole. Ten of us want to be whole. The rest of us are fine with being broken. I want to be whole. God is righteous, which simply means he's right. I want to be right. I don't want to be wrong. And so God in his holiness and his righteousness invites us into his holiness and righteousness. And he says, I don't want anything to defile you or diminish you. I don't want anything to diminish your spirit or your body. And so we cleanse ourselves from all of that. And we bring the holiness that God called us to, the wholeness God called us to, to completion in the fear of God. God calls us to wholeness, which is awesome. Because, man, I'm broken. I'm broken. Can I be honest and tell you that? Can I tell you I'm broken? Because you're broken too. And we all struggle with our brokenness and we bring that holiness. And I love he says, bring it to completion. He doesn't say make it complete right now. Your holiness and your wholeness just overnight. Yes, I'm positionally holy. Are you glad that Jesus made us positionally holy because of the cross? You should be glad. I should be glad that when Jesus died on the cross, when his body was broken for me, we're going to receive communion in a few minutes. We're going to take a piece of bread and that bread represents Jesus' body that was broken for me. Jesus' broken body. Jesus, who was perfectly God and perfectly whole, he didn't need to be broken. He surrendered and submitted to brokenness so that he could take my brokenness And he could exchange his wholeness for my brokenness. Because Jesus' body was broken, you and I can live whole. Holy, set apart. We are positionally before Jesus, holy because of what he did for us on the cross. But he calls us then to walk into that wholeness, that holiness to walk away from sin 
Because sin is serious. Can I just stop there and let that sink in? Sin is serious. Sin will kill you. Sin will destroy you. Sin will not only destroy you, but it'll infect everybody around you. The definition of sin isn't just doing bad things or making mistakes. I want you to hear that. Because some of you think, man, if I ever make a mistake, then I must be a sinner. And the reality is we are a sinner that make mistakes. But sin isn't just making mistakes. Sin, the definition of sin is rebellion against God. It's rejection of his wholeness and his life. It's, it's being willful and prideful to say, I know better than God. The root of every sin is pride that says, I know better than God. God tells me something through his word, and I'm going to look at it and say, no, thank you. I know better. The very first sin recorded in human history was when Adam and Eve decided they knew better than God, and they thought it was going to make them better. It was going to fulfill, fulfill them because sin Brokenness and rebellion against God always promises fulfillment. If I do this, I'm going to feel better. If I do this, it's going to feel good. If I do this, I'm going to be more fulfilled. If I do this, then my life is going to be more complete. Sin always lies to us about that, but sin only promises fulfillment. The reality is it diminishes us. It diminishes us completely. It pulls us apart. It breaks us. It invites death. It keeps us from what we were created for. You guys, we don't take sin seriously enough. And I'm not here trying to bat you over the head with a moral baseball bat. Please hear me. Please understand me. I'm saying this out of love because I think there's great grace in this. When we ignore and reject God, we're walking away from wholeness and completeness that he wants to give us. And God loves us so much. The reason that fearing God is hating sin is because sin destroys us. And God loves us more than that. God loves us more than that. And he wants us to walk toward him, to embrace him, to know him, to not have to fear anything else and to be whole. Holiness completes us, but only Jesus can deal with sin and make us holy. And like I said before, he did that on the cross. He dealt with my sin, my rebellion, my rejection, the death that I'd received, that I'd inherited, that I'd embraced. He makes me holy positionally because of the cross, and he forgives my sin through his blood. But church, I want to tell you something that's so amazing and so full of grace, and it's such a gift from God. That Jesus doesn't just forgive your sin. By the way, is anybody in here glad that Jesus forgives your sin? I'm really, really, really glad that Jesus forgives my sin. That's a great, that's a great start. In fact, that's the necessary start. I can't have a relationship with a holy God, a whole God, if I'm bringing brokenness to the equation. And he took care of my brokenness on the cross. And he invites me into a whole relationship that doesn't have any brokenness or death in it. Jesus forgave my sin on the cross. Can we celebrate that? Jesus forgave my sin on the cross. But Jesus did more than forgive my sin. Jesus does more than forgive my sin. Jesus, in his grace, reveals my sin so that I can deal with it. Because if I haven't dealt with my sin, guess what? I'm continuing to embrace brokenness. Jesus forgives my sin, so he puts his Holy Spirit in me and he he seals my heart, my soul for the day of redemption. He says, listen, you're going to heaven. I've forgiven your sin and you're going to heaven. I am not today, loved ones, talking about, okay, every time you sin, you're out of salvation and then you figure out how to deal with your sin and you get into salvation and then you sin again and you're out of salvation. We are not talking about eternal insecurity here, okay? We're talking about the fact that Jesus saves us for heaven when he forgives us of our sin, but then he reveals our sin to us so that it can be dealt with. Because undealt with sin will always keep you from the life that he intends you to live. And it will always cause brokenness in you and in other people. So we have to learn how to hate our sin. This is heavy, isn't it? Like I put this 
pastoral exhortation together, and I didn't think it was that heavy. I'm like, I'm going to talk about the fear of God. That's really important. And then during first service, I'm like, oh, this is heavy. <laughs> this is heavy. This, this sinks deep. Because the fear of God is the hatred of sin, and sin destroys us, but we still hang on to it. And we still allow it to infect us and affect us. So we have to learn how to hate sin. By the way, we have to learn how to hate our sin. Wait, I don't think you got that. Can I say that again? We have to learn how to hate our sin. Can I preach? Okay. Okay, can I say this a different way? I have to learn how to hate my sin. When I say the fear of God is the hatred of sin, some of you immediately went to, oh yeah, those people. Oh yeah, those people are sinners. Yeah, those people are doing what they're doing. Yeah, those people are messed up. That's right, Pastor Tim. They're broken and messed up. They need to find God. Well, they might need to, but I want to tell you, first of all, you and I need to deal with our sin. The fear of God is not hating somebody else's sin, though I think that if I fear God, I am going to hate somebody else's sin. Not because I hate them. By the way, don't ever say love the sin, hate the, love the sinner, hate the sin. That honestly can, people can misunderstand that so much. The, the heart of that I get, but people misunderstand that because really it just sounds like you're hating everything about them. We love people deeply and because we love them deeply, we don't want anything in their life that brings brokenness. And when I don't hate my own sin, then I've got stuff going on in my life that's going to break other people. And God does not want that. And so it has to start with me. Church, this is not about pointing fingers or throwing rocks or trying to define somebody else's sin. This is about me learning to hate and despise what brings brokenness to me and through me. It has to start with me. So how do we learn to hate our own sin? I got six things. I'm going to go through them really quickly. This is not comprehensive. I'm sure that we could do a series or a book or something on the fear of God. In fact, the whole Bible, really, if you're going to look at the theme of the Bible, you find the love of God and the fear of God are pretty much up there co-equally because the love of God and the fear of God aren't mutually exclusive. They're parallel. They're, They're the same thing. When I learn how to hate the things that God didn't create, when I learn how to hate the things that bring brokenness and death and destruction, I'm fearing God. And I want to be a God-fearer. The first is this. I said sin is serious, didn't I? Okay, you know what else? We should take sin seriously, and we should take God more seriously. Can I say that again? Okay. We We need to take sin seriously, but we need to take God more seriously. We need to take God seriously. I don't think we really take God seriously sometimes in our culture. In cultures past, if you showed up to a church, a good church, The mark of a good preacher was he preached the paint off the walls. And by the end of the sermon, everybody was hiding under their chairs, afraid of their life, right? They preached the fear of God and, 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 and across the line from the fear of God as the hatred of sin to the fear of God being afraid of God. But first John says there is no fear in love because fear has to do with punishment. And if you truly love God and truly have a relationship with him, you do not need to be worried about his wrath because his wrath has been taken away on the cross. If you don't know Jesus, then you're still walking under the brokenness of sin and the destruction of sin and God's wrath toward that destruction. You're a part of that because you're living under it and God has done everything that he could possibly do to separate you from the destruction and death that his wrath is, is, is targeted against. But if you know Jesus, you don't have to be afraid of God. But just because of that, I think the pendulum swung. And now we talk a lot about the love of God and the grace of God. And by the way, we should always talk about the love of God and the grace of God. Anybody with me? We should always talk about the love. In fact, we should be accused of talking about the love of God too much. If somebody ever comes to me and says, Pastor Tim, you talk about the grace of God too much. I'll be like, hallelujah. I want to keep talking about the grace of God. I'm going to keep talking about the love of God. I'm never going to give up because God loves you and he has an unmerited favor toward you, not because of what you did, because of what he's done for you. God loves you and has a gift of eternal life for you. I will never stop preaching that. Never. And you don't have to get your life in order for him to love you. The message of the good news of the gospel is he loves you first and then he starts helping you get your life in order. 
You don't have to be good enough for him because none of us could be. So that's the message that we preach. And yet we have to understand that part of him getting your life in order and part of him accepting you into his family was dealing with the sin that caused death and brokenness in and through you. And we don't take God seriously enough. We forget because God has called us his friend. Isn't that an amazing thing that Jesus says? I no longer called you servants, but I called you friends. Anybody happy about that? Isn't it an amazing thing? Listen, who is the one that said that? He was the God who was before all time, who in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He is the one whom everything was made for and through. He is the one who spoke the word at the beginning that created the universe. And he is the one that by his breath holds the universe together to this day. If God decided to stop breathing on the universe today, we would all go away like that. That's the God that calls us friend. And we need to take him seriously. And we need to understand there's something serious about the fact that I have a relationship with the God of the universe. Take God seriously, not take ourselves so seriously. Some of y'all take yourselves way too seriously. Tell the person next to you, you probably take yourself too seriously. Okay? Seriously, when we take ourselves too seriously and we don't take God seriously enough, we're putting each other in the wrong place. I need to take God seriously and not take myself so seriously enough. When I take myself so seriously, then I need to hide my brokenness and my sin and the things I need to deal with. I don't want you to see because I want you to take me seriously. It's called pride and it's the root of sin. When I take God seriously, I don't care what you know about me. I just want to please God. And I'm not going to take myself so seriously that I'm not going to please God. I'm not going to try to look good. We got to take God seriously and we'll care more about right relationship with him than how we look to other people. We'll care more about right relationship with him than we care about everything else. That is the only way to eradicate fear of everything else in your life is if you put God first. And if you care more about what he thinks than what anybody else thinks, if you care more about what he will do in your life than what anything else can do in your life, if you trust his power more than any other power in the world, then you can walk out of fear as you only fear God. Number two, how do we learn to hate sin and evil? Number two, we care more. I just said that, but I'm going to repeat it. We care more about what God thinks than about what anyone else thinks. What does God think about this situation? What does God think about what I'm doing right now? Not what does somebody else think? Not what does my best friend think? Not as what does my neighbor think? Not what does my wife think? Or what do my kids think? Or what does my pastor think? What does God think about what's going on right now? What does he think about what's happening in my head? What does he think about what's happening in my heart? What does he think about the actions that I just took? What does he think about the actions I'm planning to take? What does God think? And the way we can understand what God thinks about those things is to fall in love with the word of God. When we fall in love with the word of God, we learn more and more about what God wants. And then our goal is to say, Lord, I want what you want because I have the fear of God, the hatred of sin, the hatred of evil. Lord, I want to draw closer to you because the more I get rid of the brokenness and evil and sin in my life, the more I can draw closer, not just positionally, but practically to you. And God, I want to be close to you, not far away. We learn how to fear the Lord as we learn how to respond to him in surrender, right? Not what is, what do you think, but what does God think? An occupational hazard as a pastor that I have is thinking about what you think, worrying about what you think, being afraid of man and woman instead of fearing God. And so for a while here as the pastor, we would do ministry times and we would make altar calls. Sometimes there'd be an altar call where you come forward or you go back to pray with people. And it would be something that was, I was dealing with in my life, but I'm like arguing in my head going, I don't think I should go because people are going to think I'm a mess. Until one day the Lord delivered me from that. Cause you know what? I don't care if you all think I'm a mess because God isn't. And I get to serve him. And so last two weeks ago when we had Um, We were praying about the baptism with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit and how we leak and how we need to be filled over and over again. 
I literally in first, I think I told, may have told this service this, but I literally gave an altar call first service for people to be prayed for. And then I jumped off the platform and ran back because I was the first one to respond to my own altar call. Amen. See, we don't need to be afraid of what other people think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes, sometime I stand up and say, hey, we're going to deal with, um, with, with bondage in our life. People have the various bondages in their life. Maybe they're bound to lust or you're bound to uh, deception or you're bound to something. And I, and I would say, okay, now let's respond to that. I know some people are going to be like, wait a minute, I'm an elder in the church. Nobody can know I'm dealing with that. Nobody can know that I'm broken in that way. I want to tell you, we have to become people who care more about what God thinks than what other people think. And then we'll start living life in transparency and, and there's going to be grace and there's going to be life that happens. I want to learn how to totally surrender to God to be the first to respond and to listen to what he says. Listen, I'm trying to learn this. I don't do it perfectly, but if I, if, if I hear something in my spirit that doesn't conflict with what God's word has revealed about his nature, his character, or his ways, I'm trying to just do it. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt in your heart that you were supposed to pray for somebody, but yet you started arguing with yourself? Like, oh, they're going to think I'm weird if I offer to pray for them. They're going to think, and you argue with yourself long enough for them to get in their car and drive away, and then you're secretly relieved that you lost your own argument. A few of you have been there, all right? You think to yourself, wait a minute, I want to do this. Maybe you're in a space where you don't normally give money away to people that ask for it, but somebody's asking for money, and, and there's something in your heart that says you should you should give this person some money and then you should pray for them. Maybe it's something you're supposed to say to something, somebody as a word of encouragement. Maybe the, something prompts your heart to go talk to your neighbor. I don't know what it is, but, but can we become people who are more concerned with what God thinks about us and when he speaks to us, again, if it doesn't violate anything we know about God, that we would err on the side of saying, Lord, this may be you, it may not be you. I know it's not against your ways, so I'm going to do it anyway because I want to learn how to hear your voice. Take God seriously. Care more about what God thinks about than what anybody else thinks about. Number three, keep learning about the fear of God. Uh, Psalm 25 and and 34 are great chapters that deal with the fear of God and and not being afraid of anything else. Do you guys remember um, Joy Dawson at the church? You guys remember Joy? Joy was a a, a woman who was here for decades and um, it regularly gave prophetic words. Uh, Joy was, some of you may not even know, she was super instrumental in the world. She wrote a number of books that were translated into lots of languages. Um, pretty much every, if you've ever been to Youth with a Mission, you know who Joy Dawson is because she and her husband helped found that with Lauren Cunningham. Joy Dawson wrote a book called Intimate Friendship with God. And it's, it's basically a whole book on the fear, learning to love God and, and be friends with him through the fear of God. If you want to know more about the fear of God, read that book. intimate friendship with God. That's the title. And then the subtitles has something to do with the fear of God, but intimate friendship with God by Joy Dawson. Um, Thank you for asking, by the way. I feel like I'm a college professor again. I just, (laughs) I I used to love teaching in classrooms, so it's great. This is the biggest classroom I've ever taught to. Yeah. Uh, Read the Bible. All of it. Read all the verses that talk about the fear of God and all the context surrounding it to try to figure out what it's talking about. And then read the Bible and try to learn where it talks about sin. Because sometimes I think we're living in sin and we don't even know it because we're not aware of what the Bible calls sin. By the way, what the Bible calls sin is sin. I, I don't have to, worry, I don't have to come make, up, make it up. I don't have to figure out like, well, what's sin, what's not. In 2024, maybe it's different than it was then. Listen, there are some contextual things and you learn how to read the Bible in context. There's some you know, dietary laws that we don't have to follow anymore and there's civil and ceremonial laws that, that, that aren't necessary for us to follow anymore. But I'm telling you, if you want to know what displeases the heart of God, what gets in the way of our thriving, the more you fall in love with the word, the more you're going to understand what the fear of God is. Grow in your knowledge of the fear of God of God. The Bible says in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Anybody want to be wise in here? I do. Not just knowledge, but we live in a world that's full of knowledge. You can get more knowledge now because of the internet than people could for hundreds of years combined. But how many of you know getting all the knowledge in the world at your fingertips doesn't really help us with wisdom? I want to be wise, not just knowledgeable. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. Number four, Okay, this is a heavy one, but I'm not saying this in a heavy way. I'm saying this to myself too. But number four is this, pray that you would truly hate your sin. 
I'm going to let that sink in. Because sometimes we pray, sometimes we confess, and I'm going to talk about confession, confession and repentance in a second. But sometimes we'll confess our sins, which we need to. Sometimes we'll repent, which we need to. Sometimes we'll say, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. But we don't really hate that. I'm sorry I did that, but I don't really hate it. I'm sorry that I did it because I know it offends you, Lord. I know it gets in the way of your desire for me. I know it gets in the way of thriving. I know it gets in the way, it, 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 it invites brokenness. But secretly, I really love it. Secretly, I really love doing this, Lord, even though I know it's not okay. I, I want us to be a people who start to pray and ask God, Lord, would you teach me how to truly hate my sin? I love something Joy Dawson actually said in her book, and she said it out loud to me before, about the fear of God and truly hating your sin is to have God's attitude and reaction to sin in thought, word, and deed. To have God's attitude and reaction to sin in thought, word, and deed. That when I think about something I shouldn't be thinking about that is against what God wants for my life, that I would respond the way God would. Lord, teach me to have the same attitude you have toward that broken thought, toward that unforgiveness, toward that deception, toward that lust, toward that theft, toward that bro- any kind of brokenness. We can keep going on and on and on. Lord, I want to have your attitude and your reaction that I would absolutely be repelled by that sin and by that brokenness and by that death because I want to be somebody who's full of life. By the way, I'm not saying that you will never sin. I'm just saying that we could learn how to hate it when we do and not secretly love it and not secretly pursue it but we learn how to hate it. And that brings us to this, that we really, if we learn, really truly learn how to hate our sin, one of the ways to do that is through confession and repentance. All right. Whenever I say it's not a sermon, I go way longer. All right. I just noticed the clock. So I'm going to wrap this up actually. Confession and repentance. Worship team, why don't you come on back out here right now? Because we're going to get to communion. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I really truly learn how to hate my sin, one of the ways I learn to do that is I confess over and over and over and over and over and over and over. See, here's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to lie to you. He'll let you confess your sin once or twice or three times. But the fourth time he'll say, oh, stop doing that. See, you're just proving that you can't get over it. You're just proving that you don't, you, you're just always going to have this sin. You're just proving that you don't really mean it. And Jesus says, confess your sin as often as you sin. Not to be, for, listen, you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus, but to deal with the revealed sin in your life, to get rid of it so that it doesn't impact you, we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, I've done this thing. I've messed up. I've broken uh, promises with you. And confess your sin until you get tired of confessing your sin and then keep confessing it and keep confessing it and keep confessing it and keep confessing it and and bring it back to God because God will never get to a point where he says, okay, that's 99 times, one more time and you're finished. He will never get to a point where he says, I will not deal with your sin. I will not take it away. I will not forgive it. You can come to God as often as you need to and say, Lord, I've messed up. I've sinned. I've done something that's broken faith. I've done something that's invited death and I need to be forgiven. And every time you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Does anybody want to walk cleansed before the Lord? And if you're confessing your sin over and over and over again and you're growing in a deep hatred of your sin but you find that you can't walk away from your sin, I want to encourage you to get deliverance or discipleship. Because you need disciples. Some of you, listen, yes, your sin is between you and the Lord, by the way. If your sin is between you and somebody else, you need to confess and repent to them and say, hey, I've messed up. I've done something to offend you. I've done something to get in the way of our relationship. And the Bible makes it clear that we need to live that way. But most of the time, our sin is between us and somebody, and us and God. But don't stay between you and God if you can't get free from that thing because maybe it's your flesh has got a hold of you and you're living in bondage to your flesh and you need somebody else to walk alongside of you. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. And it's not just talking about the healing of your body. It's talking about the wholeness that you want to walk in. If you're not walking in wholeness and you're walking in brokenness because of your sin, you confess that sin to somebody else and then that person walks alongside of you and helps you to walk into wholeness. 
but maybe it's the fact that you've been bound spiritually because there are demonic entities out there that will bind us. And sometimes you need to find spiritual and supernatural deliverance from that thing that's been holding you down, that you absolutely hate, that you want to get rid of, that you've never been able to get rid of. The enemy's lie to you is you will never be able to stop sinning that way. And God says he has freedom available to anybody that would want to walk in freedom. God can give you freedom. Sometimes we need to have somebody pray supernatural deliverance, that there's some kind of demonic hold, stronghold that we need to be delivered from. Or maybe it's just flesh. Pastor Jack Hayford, who used to pastor here, once said, you can't deliver, you can't discipline a demon. You got to discipline your flesh, but you can't deliver um, your flesh. You have to discipline your, your flesh. And I want to encourage us to do that. Number six, the last thing is this. Live in view of eternity. Life is short. Eternity is long. And Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says that the whole duty of human beings is to fear God and keep his commandments. Anybody in here want to not fear anything? Anybody in here want to not be afraid of anything? The fear of God, the true fear of God allows us to never be afraid of anything or anyone else because you've surrendered to the great I am. The last series we just did, Jesus calling himself I am over and over and over and over again. Here's what God said when he revealed his name to Moses, when Jesus declared he was that name. He is saying, I am sufficient. I am everything you need. I am everything the universe will ever need. And that I am is the one we're surrendered to and submitted to. And he has everything we will ever need. And so if we fear him and if we reject the things that reject him, we're going to be closer and closer to him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful for you. And I want you to teach us the fear of God. I want this church, I want me. Lord, not just this church. Let me start with me, Tim Clark. Teach me how to fear you more. Lord, there are places in my life where I don't fear you like I should. God, I want to have a fear of God. There are places in my life where I, I want to I keep repenting. Lord, I want to I wanna get... I want to get tired of repenting. I want to see any little thing that gets in the way of my relationship with you. I want to recognize and I want to repent. I want to confess. I want to deal with. Lord, reveal to me wherever sin exists in my life. Even if other people would look at it and say, oh, that doesn't seem very bad. Lord, I want, I want to deal with it. And I want us as a church to be a people who will be so sensitive that we deal with every point of sin and brokenness in our lives. Lord, we want that. 